Well, ahoy, hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you for joining me, for following, downloading, streaming, subscribing. I'm so delighted that you've chosen to come along on this journey around the universe. Your mission, should you choose to accept. We're searching out the smartest science secrets lurking around the solar system, and you've chosen wisely. This week, honestly, we'll hear something utterly mind-boggling. It's all about how llamas could be the key to curing all diseases. Um, Hang on a second. You said you have cupboards full of viruses. Where do you get them from? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we get them from lots of different places, uh, but most importantly, um, the... Also, Techno Mum is back. This week, she's taking on a huge quiz show all about recycling. Let's get going and spin the wheel. And today's category is recycling. Your time starts now. Your first question, why is recycling important in technology? Well, recycling is important. And I've got your questions. As always, this week they are on boredom and on sleep. We'll get to that in just a sec. Stay there. It's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's get started with your science in the news. It's been revealed sky salamanders are the world's oldest. Now, they look blackish brown with orange spots all over. They're found around islands near Scotland. And researchers have found fossils there from 166 million years ago, which show they're almost the same creature. So sky salamanders are the oldest ones around. Also, here is something gross, but important and fun to hear about. It turns out foxes live mostly on dog poo. Experts have found that dog poo makes up a huge part of foxes' diets. You see, normally a fox will eat other foxes' poo. Who knew? And it's got lots of important nutrients in there, but it's quite hard to find. So instead, they have to resort to dog poo instead. And finally, a team of experts in Argentina say they have figured out why the T-Rex had a big head but small arms. They say it gave them serious survival advantages. They had strong muscles in there and their shoulders as well were huge, which helped them grip onto creatures and also push themselves up when they fell over so other prey couldn't come in and get them. That's why they had a big head but small arms. Let's catch up with Professor Hallux now. We've been joining in his dental depository series for the last few weeks. This is because his uncle, the world famous Halitosis, is celebrating his 100th birthday. So in his honour, Professor Hallux has made a pop-up mouth help desk, if you like, checking out what's going on in your gums, under your lips, through your teeth, why you have bad breath, what bacteria and germs can live there. This week, it's all about sugar. You might eat a lot of sugar every day, and we're finding out what that does to your teeth. Professor Halix's Digital Dental Depository. (laughs) To honour great uncle Halitosis, dentist extraordinaire, on the occasion of his 100th birthday, Professor Halix is creating a pop-up digital dental depository, an oral health help desk. He's going to see how many questions all about teeth he can answer against the clock. It's a super sweet set of sizzlers today, Nanobot. All about sugar. Wind it up and let it go. First question. How does sugar harm our teeth? It's not the sugar itself that causes damage to teeth. It's the acid the bacteria creates when it consumes the sugar. Sugar is a source of food and energy to bacteria, you see. And as they break it down... Acids are produced. This acid breaks through the enamel on your teeth, creating tiny holes which can cause your teeth to be sensitive to both hot and cold temperatures. Over time, those tiny holes can get bigger and bigger until they form large holes called cavities. And that's tooth decay. Good start. Oh, it's a true or false? In the UK, sugar has been causing harm to our teeth for thousands of years. True or false? I'm going to say false. 
It's false because we only started to import sugar in the Tudor period. That's from the late 1400s. Scientists know from studying the teeth in skeletons that before then people's teeth were actually pretty healthy. The first sugar and sugary delicacies were luxuries and only for the rich. Queen Elizabeth I was so fond of sugar it said her teeth were rotten and black. By the 1700s, sugar was available to everyone, and that's when tooth decay became more common. Funnily enough, that's when dentistry also became more common, with all those yucky, rotten teeth to pull out. Ew! So, if you can't resist sweet treats, what's the best way to prevent damage? Well, drinking water is a helpful way to wash the acids away. Your own spit or saliva contains minerals which can help repair damage to your teeth, so it's important to stay hydrated. The acid attacks from bacteria only last around 20 minutes, so it's better to eat sweet things over short periods, not over a long period of guzzling pop or munching on snacks. That way you're reducing the amount of time your teeth are under attack. And using a straw is a great way to stop a sweet drink coating your teeth. And don't forget to use a paper or reusable straw. Much better for the environment than single-use plastic. Coming up to the finish now. You should always clean your teeth as soon as you've had a sugary snack or drink. Is that true or false? It's actually false. When the acid is being produced, it can actually cause more harm if you brush your teeth straight away, as you might be helping the acid through the enamel. It's better to use a mouthwash and save your brushing for twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Using an electric toothbrush and flossing can help ensure you get into all the cracks. That's correct, and time's up. Brilliant, Professor. Very respectable score there and lots of data for our digital dental depository. <laughs> Professor Halix's digital dental depository. Let's get to your questions. I love this part of the show. I love the incredible questions that you come up with about all different aspects of science and then send to me as a review on Apple Podcasts. First up this week is Lucy, who's up in Scotland near, well, the world famous old Sky Salamanders are from. Lucy wants to know, why do we get bored? Well, people are bored on average 131 days of the year. Now, experts have done tests and studies on boredom. And you know what? They found out it's actually quite good for you. You see, your brain has a default state when it's not doing anything. Now, uh, your brain, when it gets used to something new, it reverts back to that default state. Kind of like a standby mode on your games console. Now, when that's happening, it makes different parts of your brain fire off. That's what happens when you get bored, and it helps you create and imagine different things, which is why boredom is actually pretty good for you. Thank you, Lucy. This one is from Kane, who wants to know why we sleep. Well, this goes back to your brain a bit as well. A few things happen in your brain and in your body when you nod off. Uh, in your head, sleep gives your mind a chance to sort through what's happened that day. It figures out what's important, what it needs to remember, and what needs to be thrown away and chucked in the recycle bin. Also, your body needs sleep because that's when it grows. That's when cells can uh, divide and multiply. That's when you get more of those. That's when your bones get longer and get stronger. And that happens a lot when you're young. So when you're a kid, you need loads more sleep than you do when you get older because you're growing so much more, Kane. Thank you for the question. If there's something science to you want answered on the show so easy, get yourself to the Apple Podcast Store if that's where you listen. Find the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Three things you need to do. Leave your name so I can say hello. Give us five stars. That really helps me see it. And then you've got a comment box at the bottom. And that is where you leave your question. And I'll try and get to it next week. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, here's a big question we're going to find the answer to. How can llamas be the key to curing diseases? We'll find out with Lauren Ason, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Rosalind Franklin Institute and joins us now. Lauren, thank you for being there. Hi. So this is all part of the Royal Society's Summer Science Exhibition. They've got a big show, which shows you how this can happen. When did we first start to think that there might be something with llamas that can help us out? 
So it's been around for quite a while, but within the last 20 years, we've decided, we've seen that the llama's antibodies look slightly different to the humans, and we thought that this may be quite useful for us in science. So what do antibodies actually look like then? How do we know that llamas look different? Uh, so human antibodies almost have a Y shape, and they almost are in double. So if you can imagine two Ys on top of each other, whereas a llama is similar to a Y, but it's a lot shorter, and we can actually break up the llama antibodies into much smaller little pieces, which are actually useful for us. So... What is it in the antibodies that might help us with diseases and curing them in the future? So antibodies are very useful in binding to the different targets. So for example, COVID, we want to bind to the spike. So we need to try to find the antibodies that bind to the correct places. So either we find an antibody that can stop it from binding or to actually kill the virus in itself. So what happens next then with it, Lauren? We, we think we've got these antibodies um, from the llamas and it might help us out. What, what do scientists need to do? So scientists then need to do a whole lot of testing. So we have little viruses in little Petri dishes in very safe cabinets. And we add these different antibodies and uh, llama antibodies to see if these antibodies will stop the viruses from progressing. And if that happens, we then go to try and test it on mouse, mouse models of uh, virally infected creatures. Um, hang on a second. You said you have cupboards full of viruses. Where do you get them from? <laughs> so we get them from lots of different places, uh, but most importantly, um, the NIH, if I remember correctly. And they've got different... Um, they literally have cupboards for people to do research on these specific viruses. And, and, and scientists can just make viruses, can they? No, so they can't just make viruses. So it's a very controlled process. And many of these viruses we get from samples that are collected from hospitals. And uh, we can only work on them if we've given them a specific plan. And so they monitor what we actually do to the virus. So we can't make a super virus or anything. So how much do we know about what diseases might be able to be cured by llamas? I mean, there's talk about COVID, but is there anything else that these antibodies can help us with? So the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic helped us to launch this platform to show that our llama antibodies can be useful against uh, a very important disease. So there's actually no, the sky's the limit to what disease we can target. So at the moment, we're going to be looking at different other viruses just to for in case something like this happens again. Uh, do, do llamas get sick themselves, do we know? No, they don't. So we don't inject the llamas with the virus particle. So we just take, like you would with your COVID vaccination, you get a small bit of the protein. That's important. So we make this protein in the laboratories and we inject the llamas with that. Oh, but what about llamas in themselves? So not, not you know, if they've got these super antibodies, are there any llama diseases that they get that really impact them? Not that I know of. So are they just, like, they're just these super beasts? They're super beasts. I'm sure they, they get sick in normal. They do get sick normally. So what our application is just very different. So we the llamas that we use are, are kept under vet supervision, like pretty much 24-7. So if there are any sicknesses, we can test for them and treat as normal. But they're normal animal diseases that you'd get, like cows get sick and horses and stuff like that. Yeah. Are these special antibodies... Uh, do we think they're almost uh, uh, like very special and exclusive to the llama? Or does this open up an idea that maybe other creatures might have some super bacteria biting antibodies that maybe we can use? So, yeah, so the llamas, they come from the camelid family. So camels also have these kinds of antibodies. Uh, they're just a lot more difficult to get hold of, llamas we can get here in the UK, whereas, uh, or much easily. And another kind of antibody are sharks. Sharks have also special types of uh, frameworks for their antibodies, which people have actually looked at. But I would rather look at 
try and keeping llamas than a shock to get these antibodies from. <laughs> you don't want to be a, you don't want to be someone in a scuba suit having to try to prod a shark under the ocean. Yeah, no, not not for me, hey. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, listen, we can find out loads more. As I say, the Royal Society have got their summer science exhibition on uh, in the next few months, where you can learn all about llamas helping us fight viruses. Uh, Lauren Ason, thank you so much for joining us. Now, this week's Dangerous Dan is something truly terrifying. Every week we talk about some of the mean and cruelest things in the world and the universe. This week it's something that might actually give you nightmares. Let's take a look at the scorpion fly. What do you reckon they look like? Well, they look scary. They've got a yellowish orange back with a black stripe that runs down it. They've got a huge black and white patterned wing, a large snout on their head, which they use to feed. The most terrifying thing to look at, though, and it's what gives them their name, is their tail. It flicks out the back of their body with a curved end that makes it look a bit like a scorpion. Now, that's used for mating, and they're found all around the world. And what makes this creature really creepy? They're predators of other dead animals. They're normally the first insects to arrive at a creature that has just gone and it feasts. And what makes them even worse, get ready for this, it's not nice, but they're known to be particularly obsessed with dead humans. It's a strange fascination, but it means the scorpion fly goes straight onto our dangerous down list. It's time to check in with Techno Mum now. She is our favourite gadget genius. We've heard a few series with her before when she answers your questions about technology. And this time out, uh, she's getting involved in a brilliant new quiz show. It tests her knowledge more than most times. Uh, finding out all about the, the most amazing, epic new discoveries, the new things we found in tech and how they are useful and how they came about. This week, it's all about recycling. Welcome back to Tech Trivia, the game show that tests the technical talents of our tremendous contestants. And playing this week, it's Techno Mom. Hi. Now you've been smashing our scoreboard so far, but the game's not over yet. Let's get going and spin the wheel. And today's category is recycling. Your time starts now. Your first question, why is recycling important in technology? Well, recycling is important for everyone. There's only a certain amount of resources on our planet, and with many of them, once they're gone, they're gone. Now, most designers want their things to make to be available not just today, but tomorrow, next week, and even next year. That's called being sustainable. But if you want your stuff to be sustainable, you need to think carefully as you design your new product and before choosing the raw materials. Sometimes reusing something can be cheaper than using something new. You've probably got a refillable water bottle for school. That's certainly cheaper than buying a new bottle every day. Well, these days, designers will design what they make so parts can easily be reused. Did you know that around 90% of a modern car can be recycled? Metals can be used to build a new car, whilst old tyres can go into road surfacing. And if you think about it, design is not just about reusing materials. Part of what engineers do every day is recycle ideas, reusing the very best ideas, improving them to come up with brilliant new solutions to problems. Well, you're improving your score, right? Next question. Name a cool way recycling has solved an engineering problem. Oh gosh, there's loads. Well, a bit like glass bottles, plastic bottles can also be recycled and made into clothing. The plastic is shredded, melted and spun into polyester. That's a type of thread. And milk cartons can be recycled as well, into other plastic things like fence posts. In fact, new plastic can be made from all sorts of substances. There's even a type of plastic which is made from pig wee. Ah, oh, gross. But hey, that is pretty cool. Last question, and you're going to have to be quick. Can you give me a job where you'd need to use recycling? Mm, I'm going to say aerospace engineering. That's like being a rocket scientist. In some places, recycling is the only way to get things done. For example, space. If you were travelling to Mars, you can't get supplies along the way. But supplies are heavy and they can slow you down. So the more you can recycle, the further you can go. Aerospace engineers are expert at figuring out ways to reuse things that are likely to run out like water to drink and oxygen to breathe. I have to stop you there. The results are through, and you're through to the next round, Techno Mum. Great. That means you won't need to get a new contestant in. Recycling in action. Techno Mum's Tech Trivia. 
And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If there's something you want answered on this show next week, dead easy. Here's what you need to do. Get to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a question as a review. I will see it and I'll try and cover it. I'll do all the research next week on the podcast. Also, while you're on Apple, you can hear loads of the brilliant series that we do. We've got them there on Google, Spotify as well. And they're on the free Fun Kids app. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen all around the country on your DAB digital radio and over at funkidslive.com. 